Welcome, everybody, to the March Q&A with Bill Hartman here at IFAS University. We have uh, some familiar faces, some unfamiliar faces, some interns, previous and current, and one of them just disappeared on me. Hopefully he comes back. Um, Bill, is there anything you'd like to say? Nope, absolutely not. <laughs> hello, 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 everybody. So basically what you're doing here. Um, while you're not talking or while someone else is talking, please mute your mic because the, the, the reverb kind of shuts off whoever's talking. And uh, if you have any questions, you can, you can message me privately and I'll try to get, when we get a break, I'll try to get you in there or just assert yourself like a, like a grown up. I, I believe in you. Uh, okay, who has a question? I know that nobody would ever have a question from Columbus, Ohio, or anything like that. All right? You gonna let me down, brother? I, I feel like this is my role here, is to get us started. You, you, you're the initiator. Yeah, absolutely, you are. Fire away, man. Uh, with uh, you were talking about how infrapubic angles and infrasternal angles typically match, but sometimes they don't what mm -hmm. tests you use to confirm your belief of whether it matches or not, like comparing uppers to lowers. Um, so, so, so this is, this is a, a, um, it's, it's more of a thought than a direct measurement because putting your hands on somebody's pubis is a little bit uh, invasive, um, or not invasive. What's the right word for that? Um, and, it's very personal. Um, so uh, if, if we surmise the position of the sacrum, that would determine what the infrapubic angle will be doing, right? So in, in the case of, say, a, a, a wide infrasternal angle, my, my assumption is that I'm going to have a wide infrapubic angle, which would, be a count, which would be a mutated sacrum, right? And so the mutation of the sacrum is what, what gives me that, that bit of information. You can also use some hip measures to, to help you confirm that. So hip abduction might be limited uh, on the wide side, if you will. And if, there, if it would be wide on both, then you'd see limitations in hip abduction on both sides. So it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. sort of a, a, a deductive reasoning process because I'm not going to go down there and, and measure that directly. And, and I don't even know if you could, you know, uh, tell whether you had a wide or a narrow in that case. And so, again, it's just, it's just a deductive process of what do my tests tell me? What is this indicating? And, and uh, you know, if, if somebody has a full excursion of respiration throughout the axial skeleton, they won't match, um, mm. nor, nor should they, right? Um, and so... Again, this would be in a, in a situation where you're initiating treatment and um, your, your test would, in, would be indicative of the fact that you don't have full respiratory excursion of the axial skeleton. And that's when they would typically match. And that's indicative of the fact that you've, you've got a matching infrasternal angle and infrapubic angle. Does that help? Outside, outside of hip abduction, would there be... You know, would you expect to see maybe less hip IR on, you know, a narrow and for pubic angle versus a, a wide? Like, could you start to make some yeah. educated guesses on yeah, those absolutely. things? Absolutely. But I, but, I, but I would caution you against using hip internal rotation as your guide because there, if you think about it, I, in the case of a, of a mutated sacrum, um, you should actually gain hip internal rotation. But if you have somebody that, that um, is driving the pelvis into an anterior orientation, they may actually increase the amount of, of external rotator activity at the hip, which would limit IR. So, so you could have excessive IR or limited IR um, under a, a similar um, descriptive presentation of, of, a, of, a, of a mutated or an anterior tilted pelvis. So, so I don't like to use the IR, although it may fit, and it will allow you to sort of come up with a more extensive description of the entire position rather than just 
you know, looking at it in, in, in one piece of, of the pelvis. And so you could say, well, now I have somebody with increased activity of the external rotation versus somebody that has maybe a, a bony positional limitation of internal rotation. That, that was going to be my next question is. Um, I knew that. Do, I knew that. That's why I jumped yeah. on it right away because I knew, I knew how you think. <laughs> do, do you, <laughs> do, like, do end feels come into play, like even with like an adduction drop test, like a, a bony end feel versus, you know, soft tissue end feel, same thing with like hip internal rotation? I think, I think end feels always play a role. The, the question then becomes of, is of what value is it? And, and if it adds value to your, to your, your diagnosis of position, then I say it adds value. And if it doesn't, it doesn't, um, you know, and then trying to discern though, what the end feel really is, you know, I'm not Stanley Paris and I don't have 16 different end feels in my head. I've got, you know, a couple that, that allow me to surmise whether I'm confirming something that I suspect versus it's going to tell me what's going on. I don't, I don't, I don't use it to that degree uh, mm -hmm. um, of absolution. It, it's, it's more of a, a confirmation of what I already suspect. Suspect. Okay. Yeah. I think you, you know, honestly, it's like you use anything that will help you make a determination of what you need to do next. You know, people yeah. want to, people want to poo poo certain aspects of, of, of an examination. And it's like, well, you know, sometimes it's meaningful and sometimes it's not. And, and how do you know you were right? Well, you intervene and then you see what the outcome is. And that's your determination, whether you were right or whether you were wrong. And that's how you learn. And that's how you address these things. And, and I was, I was texting back and forth with Brian Chung today and, and we were talking about evidence and such. And, and, uh, um, and he brought up the, the very valid point is that, is that evidence-based is, is directly related to the individual that you're working with. It's not about this broad population kind of a thing. It's the, it's the person that's in front of you. And, and we have to think along those lines. And so use any tool at your disposal. Use any evaluation process at your disposal to allow you to provide the best intervention possible to get the ideal outcome. Okay. Yeah, that, that helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks for starting this thing. Seriously. Do you have any more? You Corey? Know, I get the feeling that, that if Steven and, and I were, were having a, a nice casual drink in a bar and somebody wanted to start a fight, that Steven would throw the first punch. You know, <laughs> He's that kind of guy. The sleeper, the quiet one. Yeah. You and can't then just him. one second, just... Just like out of nowhere. Out of nowhere just insane anyway anyway keaton, who's next keaton's got a question i can tell i feel it brother yeah so um one of the things that i've kind of picked up on here recently uh is in the, in the cervical spine I've, I've noticed that left cervical radiculopathies have been tougher to resolve the the distal symptoms and i i was more or less wondering if that's a, a factor of the cervical orientation or if I'm missing something down through the thorax or, or whatnot. Do you, do you have, I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of broad scope there, isn't it? I know. I know. It's, yeah. it's, that's why I didn't have a real good question. It wasn't formulated, but how are you, how are, are you, are you receiving this diagnosis as, as the, on the referral kind of a thing? Uh, I am. Uh, they also have positive uh, spurlings and neural uh, neurodynamic testing in upper extremity, and so mm -hmm. I, I that's that's where I'm getting caught up is whether it's cervical orientation or if it's a peripheral mm -hmm. entrapment in which one's being the driver. And so mm -hmm. I, I know that's, that's a broad question, but well, you know, for me, the process is basically the same. Right. No matter what the diagnosis is written on the on the script, I have to eliminate those things that that have the broadest impact first and foremost, which is I try to restore as much variability to the movement system as possible. So so I have to you got a little buddy there behind you. Keaton. And uh, and so um, so that's my first first step of the process. And so. You know, if I if I can get my appendicular measures to to go normal, um, including the 
anything that I would measure in the cervical spine. And then I go back to my neuro, neurodynamic tests and I have to see what the outcome is there. A lot of times when you can restore the, the appendicular range of motion, a lot of those, those tests get better. Now, if you've got a true cervical, you know, proximal cervical problem, chances are, you know, if it's disc driven kind of a thing, um, I don't know how much of an impact you're going to give somebody unless you can make some space, right? Because nerves like what three things, movement, space, and blood flow. Um, and so if, if you can provide those three things, then absolutely you should see, you know, I, I would, I won't say absolutely, but, but I would hope that you would see a, a favorable change in your test. So I would keep driving that first and foremost before you try to, um, you know, say that, okay, I need a, a, you know, before I would do a slider, I would make sure that I have the range of motion available, you know, in, in, in all of those, those peripheral tests. Um, and, and then, you know, there's going to be this, some of those people that you're not going to be able to make an impact. You know, you've got somebody with, with foraminal stenosis and, and osteophytic changes and, and, and such that um, you can't change that, right? Now, if you can make some space there for them, then, then maybe you can. So to say that it's one or the other, I think that, that you can, again, process of elimination and, and some deductive reasoning as to what your, your peripheral measures are giving you. you know, if, you've got, if you've got full shoulder range of motion available to you and, and you're not feeling any uh, limitation on your, your neurodynamic testing, where you're not feeling that resistance, you know what I mean when I when I say that, um, and and because uh, like Shacklock's perception of of what those outcomes should be is a little bit different than some some other practitioners, where he'll talk about the resistance of the to to stretch of those tests. Um, so so if all that stuff appears to be as normal as possible, then then this might be somebody that you go, okay, I'm sending you back to the doc, right? Um, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're keeping stats and you're, and you're, you're, you're telling me that, okay, the left side thing is always harder than the, than the right side, then maybe you do have, you know, a mechanical position that, that is leading you in that direction. And, and, and depending on what your findings are in regards to, to patterning of, of movement, then you go right back to where you started. Right, I have to make sure that 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 thorax has all the variability available to it. However, I achieve that, whether it be a respiratory-driven intervention, whether it be a manual therapy intervention, whether it be an exercise-related intervention, I have to I have to regain that first and foremost. So I eliminate, you know, all the 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 possibilities um, before I I decide that oh, this is just somebody I can't help. That was probably not the answer that you wanted. No, I mean that's I mean that's kind of the, <laughs> the answer I expected. Um, yeah. It's just one of those things I was trying to decide. Obviously, we know neuro leads a lot of the biomechanical influences, and right. if we needed to restore normal neuromechanics, or just try to influence the biomechanics of the thorax first to create that space, or you know, chicken or the egg on that. But so so let me offer you this, brother. What can you measure? You have to rely on what you can measure, right? That's all we. It's all we have. And and so we end up measuring the skeleton more often than anything else, right? Yeah. Because it because it's it's the most consistent thing that that we have available to us. It's the easiest thing to measure. Um, you know, as imprecise as all of that is, it, it's it's the best thing that we have. Even our neurodynamic tests are not exceptionally clear. I mean, there are times where we can identify the, the before and after differences. There's no question about that. And whether the symptoms change or not, we can, we can somehow, or sometimes rather feel the, the differences, but, but the, the one thing that we can rely on the most or have to rely on the most is our skeleton, right? It's the most predictable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, while we're on the radiculopathy train, um, with with patients who maybe you've restored variability but they haven't seen symptom improvement are mm -hmm. there 
do, do you have any typical advice that you give them? Um, are there what what are some inter, other interventions you may try with them? Um, so if if I have everything that I can that I can produce and and there's still symptoms there now, if we're talking about like a peripheral neurologic type of symptom, the the thing that you have to remember in in the acute situation is that just by restoring normal variability, so let's just say that I have, I have full respiratory excursion restored, I have full appendicular range of motion restored, all of my neural dynamics appear to be golden, right? Everything is as good as I can possibly get it. Uh, now I have to maintain that because the, the peripheral nerves behave a little bit odd in the fact that it might be 10 days later before you notice the difference because of the way that the, the, the nerves adapt, right? And so you ever have those patients that, that you pat yourself on the back because you did such a great job with, they feel great when they walk out the door and then you get the phone call two days later, they go, I don't know what you did to me on Tuesday, but, right? Yeah. And, and so why would that happen? Especially when and they, and they say, I'm following through on all your instructions. I felt great after I left the office. I felt great yesterday. And today it's just horrible. It's worse than it was when I first came to see you. And then you, you just feel like you're about two inches tall. And, and, but the reality is, is that's, that's how, how those peripheral nerves can behave. And so, you know, somebody might leave the office and, and not have experienced any change in symptoms, even though you restored everything you possibly can. And then maybe, you know, a week later, they feel great. They'll blame it on something else because they'll say, well, you know, I had warm milk for, for, <laughs> for my dinner last night and that's probably what it was because it had nothing to do with what you did a week ago because that's impossible but the reality is that's how those peripheral nerves are going to behave but we just don't know what the, that behavior is going to be and so again that's why we kind of default back to like hey what can we measure what can we what can we help these people with and and you know as i always say you kind of left it let the chips fall where they may and 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 that's the outcome that you're going to get any feelings in regards to, you know, anti-inflammatory pain medication with like an acute, uh, um, you know, if it, do you have any feelings one way or the other? Um, I have feelings, but um, this is being recorded and I don't prescribe medication. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> I do have feelings about it. Um, you know, I mean, you know, in, in an acute situation, I, I think that, that, you know, the, the physician is in charge of all that and they will prescribe what they feel is the appropriate medication under the circumstance. And, and some people respond to that, that very well. And some people don't. And again, the, the doctor's in the same boat that we are, unless they're taking some sort of direct measurement that's going to say, Oh, we have an inflammatory process here. They have to kind of default into, okay, they're, they're, potentially some inflammation here. Um, if I give them a, you know, a, a limited dose of, of anti-inflammatory, we'll have to kind of see what happens. And that's why you get the standard, the, the standard prescriptions that, that the patient gets and they walk in, they all kind of say the same thing when they have a musculoskeletal problem, right? And, and you've had enough re repeat business from, from physicians who, who you, you kind of know what that patient's going to, to begin with under those circumstances. But that's why they send them to you too, because, you know, the doc has a limited um, scope and time and, and, and such. And so that's why they're trusting you. And so you, um, wh whether you agree or disagree, you have to put some trust in the, in the physician's capabilities under those circumstances. Sure. Sure. Thanks. Corey Heck is just sitting there, just hanging out. I get chime in. Can you go over exactly what you mean by full respiratory excursion? Yes, I can. Did you want me to do that now? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So um, the the easy way the easy way to say this is is that the axial skeleton and actually the entire skeleton, if you if you really want to get technical about it, will move through. Um, specific motions associated with breathing. So when I breathe in, 
there are certain things that happen. For instance, so I take my breath in and my sternum uh, pump handles up, right? The, the rib cage will, will bucket handle. So that's an, an inhalation state. And in response to that, all the other bones will move as well. In fact, all your organs move, which is probably even more interesting than, than the bony movement. Because um, what the organs do is infinitely more fascinating because there's a lot of physics involved. But, um, but so what we want to be able to do is make sure that, that each of those joints that has to move. So every rib joint has to be able to move a certain amount. And, and, and then the sacrum it, is going to counter mutate. It's going to tilt backwards when you breathe in. It's going to tilt forwards when you breathe out. So the ilium has to move in opposition to that. The spine has to be able to move. So th this all occurs in, in, in three dimensions in the axial skeleton. And so we can, we can measure that to a certain degree via our appendicular motions that we'll use. So we measure hip motions, we measure shoulder motions and cervical motions and such. And then we do some, some other measures that will tell us and provide us the information whether this person can move through that full range of motion. So does the sacrum move through its full, full range of, of counter nutation to nutation based on respiration? And, and that provides me a, my starting point in most cases during during treatment or whether I'm working with that, with an athlete that that's not in pain, but maybe has like a, a, a performance related issue or a movement restriction that, that we identify dynamically and we want to try to identify as to why that might be. And so that's what I'm talking about when we talk about respiratory excursion is if, if they have normal uh, extremity movement and if I can identify whether the, the rib cage has its capacity to move, then these people tend to move really well dynamically. They probably have full excursion. Does that clarify a little bit? Yes. Okay. So, and, and, and it's, a, it's, it's, I mean, it's a monster. It, and that's why we always, I mean, you, you've been around enough, you've been around us enough to know that, that this is why we spend so much time with this because um, it is sort of foundational to everything because everybody's going to breathe right? And, and you're going to find a way, otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? You'd be dead. And so, you know, the, the brain doesn't care necessarily whether you can touch your toes. It only cares whether it gets enough oxygen. And, and so it will find a way if it has to restrict motion, if it has to tilt something in certain directions, if it has to orient a socket in a certain direction, it will do so to assure that that you remain alive and and it sounds very dramatic when you say things like that but but that's the reality we're wired for survival and then to make another copy of us and and so you know the survival part plays into everything that we do every decision that we make every movement that that you are capable of is based on your ability to survive so the like full excursion is kind of like your baseline and then you're kind of going off if there's movement that shouldn't be there based on sort of what I'm seeing, then that's where like your compensatory strategies start to come into play, stuff like that. Right. So, so let's look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, I, I think you, you totally get it. Um, so yeah. You would have what we would consider the, the, the normal expected motion. And um, if something um, would, would be still within that normal motion, but it's not expected. So if, if, if I would expect a certain pattern of movement, so when the, the, um, when the uh, ilium is rotated forward under, under normal conditions, you would, you would position the hip in flexion, internal rotation, adduction. So I would expect to see a certain type of movement pattern there. If something is still within the normal range of, of motion there, I could consider that a compensatory movement. The compensatory movements happen all the time dynamically to, to make sure that, that the, the human system, movement system is remaining stable. And I, by stable, I don't mean immobile. I mean within a, within a range of, of performance that allows it to achieve the outcome. Um, when you have a motion that is, that is outside of those normal measurements, then you're most likely dealing with a compensatory adaptation. 
And those are the things that really need to be managed. I don't mind compensatory movement because like I said, it's a normal process to, to, re, to remain um, capable of, of achieving the desired outcome. But when you see the adaptations, um, those are the things that are more difficult to control. All right. And, and if I could give you an example, let's take a, let's take a really high level gymnast who when she's 14 years old or 15 years old or 16 years old has all this crazy intentional compensatory adaptation, right? Because her performance demands it. And now let's make her 25. And now she still has all this compensatory adaptive change that she has to be able to manage. And that's where a lot of the problems can arise because now she may not have the control because when she's not as trained, she might actually have gained height and weight that makes it harder to manage and so on and so forth. So, so again, that I'm glad you asked that because it's very important that we distinguish between what we would consider the norm and an, an acceptable com compensatory movement. And then the, the uh, manageable compensatory adaptation. Awesome. Question. You got smarter since you were with us, man. That's awesome. I love that. Been trying. Well, that's good. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. You asked good questions when you were there, though, too, that I, I must say. I don't know what's wrong with our interns now. That's a joke, kids. That's a joke. That's a joke. Corey, you better uh, you better take a screenshot of this recording and then tell all your friends that he just said that. That's pretty nice. I already did. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, can I offer a follow-up? Uh, absolutely not. Go ahead. Uh, do you have any um, any references or recommendations for people who don't understand quite like what normal movement might look like um, and how to differentiate between normal and abnormal? What, what are we, might, are we, are we talking about like a, like something that we can measure or are you talking about like dynamically or? Uh, that's an interesting question. I would like to hear both, but I think uh, mm -hmm. dynamically might be a priority in terms of. So, so dynamically is exceptionally difficult because movement happens at such a high rate of speed. Um, and so, so it would be very like, so consider a, a basketball player going up for a layup. It might look perfectly normal, but if we zoomed in on his ankle at the moment of, of, uh, uh, in the moment that he leaves the floor, you might see that he's making like a frontal plane adjustment through the ankle that allows him to maintain his, his trajectory because he didn't know exactly how he was going to land. And so the body makes the, the, an adjustment and, and he's probably not even aware of it either. And so that still falls within a normal range because he didn't blow out an ankle doing it. Right. So it, it's probably an acceptable uh, compensatory motion in, in that case. Um, and so again, dynamically, it's very, very difficult to do so. And you also have to take into consideration um, the, the, the forces involved, the velocity, um, because soft tissues will behave differently, different velocities, right? So if I have a, a, a tendon and I move it slowly, it will stretch. If I have a tendon and I move it very, very quickly, it becomes very, very stiff. And, and so the dynamic behaviors are very, very difficult to assess. That's why we can't, we can't rely on, on passive measures or slow measures um, as a representation of what should happen at normal high rates of speed. Um, so, so it, uh, I'll give you a for instance. So uh, we had a pitcher in yesterday and um, he's coming off of a, uh, of a surgery and, and, but he's back on the mound throwing and he felt great. Everything went perfectly, but because he took a slow-mo video, we were able, actually able to pick out a couple of things that, that we didn't really um, think was ideal and now he's aware of them and we've made some adjustments as to how he's going to proceed and, and he feels really good about it. But, but we needed the slow-mo video to do that because when you're throwing at 7,000 degrees per second or whatever it is for the shoulder, kind of hard to slow that one down with your eyes. Right. Um, so, you know, when we're measuring something on the table, much, much more um, simple in regards to what we would expect 
to see from a normal perspective. And then you're going to see more of the, you're going to see more of the jump from what I would expect to see normally to a, a compensatory adaptation. So how about somewhere at like middle ground? So maybe not a pitch or a jump, but maybe a, a squat or a deadlift in the gym. How, how do you look at someone and say, like, I, I mean, I know you've been watching people move for a long time and that's probably a lot of where this comes from. Yeah. Um, some younger coaches might look at that and they're not, they're not able to say he just doesn't have hip mobility or he's just really tall. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you differentiate between those two? How do I differentiate? Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to watch it and see, to yeah. be honest with you. I mean, and, and it's, it's, it's really easy for me to sit back and say that. And, and it sounds like a cop out, but the reality is, is that's the reality. I think it's a good message though. Continue. <laughs> So, so, okay. Um, I, I told this story today. I'm going to tell it again because it's actually uh, um, somewhat fitting, somewhat fitting. I, I don't know. I mean, I just like to tell it. Um, so this lady goes to a park and she sits down next to a bench and she has a conversation with an old guy sitting on the bench. And it turns out that it's Pablo Picasso. So, so she, she goes, wow, that this is amazing. And I mean, you're like the greatest artist that's ever lived, blah, blah, blah. She goes, would you draw a picture of me? And he says, sure. She hands him a piece of paper. He draws her portrait, hands it back to her. And he goes, that'll be $5,000. And she goes, wait, wait, wait a minute. You just drew for five minutes. She, she goes, that, that, how could that be worth $5,000? He goes, well, I've been doing this my entire life to get that five minute picture. Right. And so, um, you know, I've got, over well shoot oh my god i'm old i got 30 years of looking at people and making mistakes and and so the picture that i have in my head of what is considered ideal um is a lot different than somebody that that's been doing it for four months or four years or whatever so i have more reps in my head i have a, I have a much broader comparison so when when i see somebody move or perform a specific movement um i I have the capacity to identify it as a movement versus looking at the different pieces and parts, which is what I did when I first started, like everybody else does, because you can't see the whole thing. And, it, and it, it's not that it's some great superpower or anything. It's just that that's, that's the association with doing this for a really, really long time and actually paying attention. Um, and so, so you, you do the, the best that you can. You have, a, you have a, a, uh, an experience that you have, you have some rules that, that you have in your head that you've either been taught or you evolved or, or developed. And, and that's what you have to go by from a dynamic standpoint. So, uh, and the, the nice thing about complexity is that, that be, because it is complex, there can be more than one right answer. So maybe you are right about something and, and you know, but maybe you don't know. And it's okay not to know. You just got to try to figure it out when you're, you know, and then you maybe you rely on somebody else to give you some guidance. And that's why we do mentorship. You know, that's, that's why that mentorship stuff becomes important because there's a lot of things that you can't get in a textbook. There's a lot of things that granted Google knows everything. Um, but the, the tacit knowledge that's associated with what we do for a living cannot be written down. It has to be experienced. You have to be in the room. You have to try to ask the questions and understand what happened in that moment that made you make that decision. And, and it's impossible to write that down. You just can't do it. And, and so again, for the, for the younger coaches that, that, struggle it's okay you're supposed to struggle because you're not supposed to know everything right now and and there is an element of experience that becomes essential to do this and and it also um, is reliant on uh, someone else's experience that you spend time with that's why it's so important you know to 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 undergo mentorship or internship or spend time with other coaches and to ask questions and to say, why do you do this? And, and not turn it into an argument, but, but to determine like, okay, this is a perspective that I'm just not aware of, or I need to try to understand this better. And then that's how you get better. And that's how maybe, maybe you see some things um, at a much later time than you do now. At least I hope you do. If you want to get good, you will. 
I love it. You, you've talked about before <laughs> just seeing what you've done three years ago and just thinking, oh my God, I can't believe I used to do that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, and, you know, I've only been doing it a couple of years, but I've had that too. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't hate who you were last year, you know, you're probably not getting better. You know, I mean, we all change and there's certain things that you'll, you'll never change. And, and, but, but if you keep learning and, and the thing that, that I've been preaching lately, um, I had a talk with, with one of our, one of our good buddies that, that is, is working at the professional level recently. And, and we were talking about going back to some of the older stuff that, that we used to look at. And, and I suggest you do so because you're not the same human that you were last year or, or two years ago or three years ago. And now when you read that same thing, you're going to read it from a different level of analogy that it might have a totally different perspective for you. And so I, as I'm going through some of this anatomical stuff that, that, that I've been working on, I just have a totally different perspective now than I had, you know, two years ago. And, and so it's a lot more meaningful and a lot, a lot of different ideas come to mind. And now when I'm looking at the patient, I have a different perspective. And, and so that's one of those really, really cool things about being able to look back and go, wow, you were an idiot for doing that. But, but look where you are now and, and look how much better you are, um, you know, for, for the things that you've done. So, you know, you can hate yourself all day long for that stuff. I do, but uh, you know, you just keep getting better. And that's how you know you're getting better. And when you feel that way, right? I mean, if you said, wow, I was great five years ago, you know, then you probably suck. <laughs> Sorry to hijack that, guys. Who's next? Interns? We got a bunch of interns on here and they're not seeing anything. Man, that's disappointing. They're probably tired. We're, we're remodeling. What are you guys remodeling? Uh, everything. <laughs> okay. No, the whole, the whole front's going to be different. So. Sweet. Mm -hmm. Jason Neal, superstar powerlifting coach. So, so I'll brag on IFAST while we have a moment here. So IFAST won the team trophy. What, what was the meet, Jason? You have to unmute yourself, brother. It was a meet in Kokomo. It was the NASA State Championship. There we go. There's the team trophy right there. And Jason was the coach. He's a, he's a superstar. God does it. Too. <laughs> My bad guy. That that was a little rough, brother. <laughs> Okay. Corey, what are you reading right now? Am I reading right now? Yeah. Say exercise metabolism. Exercise metabolism. Oh, good. So, did you steal that book from, from the office? Because I can't find my copy. I did not. <laughs> okay. Just checking. Not, not that Lance, I would – I wouldn't accuse you of stealing. <laughs> Lance told me to pick up a copy, so okay. giving it a try. That's a nice little book. Do you have any questions yet, Core Core? Um, I do actually. So I could just be making this bigger than it is, but kind of something that pops in my head is just kind of like shifting from anaerobic to aerobic. There's kind of like a delay to turn on the aerobic system. No, there's not. Mm -mm. Go, go ahead. Finish your question then. So kind of like at the onset of like an exercise, you're going to have to use aero or anaerobic system. Right. So if we can kind of increase aerobic power and get that on quicker, yeah, we can kind of decrease fatigue and get more work done through a workout, something like that. Am I yeah. kind of on the right track here with that? Yeah. Yeah, but let me let me let me just offer your perspective, right? Okay, so as we're sitting here right now, um, which energy systems are working? All of them. 
Exactly. So when you start an exercise, aren't all of them going at the same time? It's just the different rates at which they can provide energy. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so it's not that the aerobic system is delayed. It's just that it's a much more complex system. So it takes longer for it to be able to, to produce enough output to contribute. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so theoretically there are methods that will allow you to, to do that faster, right? So if I have more of the aerobic enzymes and um, all the constituents of the aerobic system uh, in quantity through training, then, then theoretically you can accelerate the, the, the uh, rate at which it can start to contribute. But I don't know how much of that, I don't know how much of, of an impact that, that, that we make directly on that a lot of times. I don't think it's as cut and dry as do this protocol and you'll increase the rate. Um, Cause again, it's like, as long as we have more stuff to work with, right. Um, we, we can certainly get better at it, but I don't know how huge an impact it would make. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Did you read the, did you read the one study where they did the, the, the really short protocol, the, the sprint protocol, and, and where each, each uh, it was like a four minute rest. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the aerobic system kicked on like really strongly, even by the second, the second yeah. interval. Yeah, so that's a really good representation of, of, of kind of what the, the question is, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, look, look at Lance throwing it up, throwing the study up on the screen, there you go. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that, that, that just kind of gives you an example that it, 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 it comes on as, as, you know, quick as, as it can. I think that the only thing that would probably, you'd have to train a lot to, to make a gigantic impact on that mm -hmm. as far as the, the rate goes. I, I, I guess you know, I, go ahead. I'm trying to kind of keep this like practical and figure out sort of how can we sort of incorporate the energy systems into like programming so we can start to increase like work done throughout a session, stuff like that, just so we can kind right. of get more from clients. That's kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if, uh, I, I don't know how much thinking in energy systems helps if we, if we know what the desired outcome is. Um, because at no point in time do you know what the contribution of those systems are in a, in a real time situation. So during a training session, how do you know how much is anaerobically driven? How do you know how much is aerobically driven? I think that you focus on the outcome. So, so let me give you, let me try to give you a, for instance. Okay. So if you're training a, a, a 10 K runner and a 400 meter guy, all right. So theoretically, our 400 meter guy would have to rely a lot on anaerobesis, right? So about half, a little bit more than half. Um, and our, our distance guy probably doesn't have to, to demand much. So, so um, which, which one would be more reliant on um, high threshold motor units to fire to run their race, the 400 meter guy or the distance guy? 400 meter guy? Of course. So, so do I want to do a bunch of long, slow distance? Well, and there's times to do it and I get that, but I'm just speaking, I'm trying to, to identify some specificity here in your programming, right? So if I need to access high threshold mode units, does it behoove me to do a bunch of long, slow distance? Probably not. As, as a developmental aspect, probably not, right? So, so now I know that that so his intervals and his his running is going to be at a higher higher velocity than than my distance guy would be, right? And so now I know that what type of interval that I'm going to be now. So here's a little interesting twist of fate. So if let's just say that my 400 meter guy is very reliant on, on anaerobic resources. So he's going to use a lot of glycolysis because of the duration of his race. So let's just say he's world class. He runs like a 45 second 400. Um, how do I assure 
from an interval training standpoint that he's using glycolysis and not dipping into aerobic resources when I'm, when I'm programming his, his intervals. Do you know? Can you, is there a way to know for sure? Like what? He's so using? once again, I would agree with you that you don't know for sure, but what if I, so how can I, how can I bias my training to give me the best shot at, at, at identifying that would you use like a tell him to run at a certain intensity or right like that? okay so so i need a certain intensity so again I, I have to have a high rate of speed right but what about the rest interval what would what would you so what would you put so let's let's just say we're running quarters and and what would be the rest interval between quarters to assure that he's he's emphasizing the anaerobic side of of the demand it would have to be incomplete based on Incomplete. How he, how he recovers. Okay, so so what what happens what 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 happens if if I if I don't rest enough in the next interval based on what you know from the book that you just held up? You're gonna increase like H plus gonna, ions stuff like that. What what, what which which energy You're system gonna, are you okay. are you going to to in, to increase the demand on? When you'd increase it in on aerobic. You yeah. Be able to use that so so okay. if that's not the adaptation that I'm chasing, then I need this guy to rest a really, really long time mm -hmm. because, because eventually the, the glycolysis is just going to inhibit itself. And now I'm going to have to rely on aerobic sources and I'm going to lose my power output. And now I'm not able to access my high threshold motor units because I don't have enough energy production that's, that, that's being produced fast enough to do so. Right. Mm -hmm. So so now I've got a guy that ran a 400 meters and he's going to rest 15 minutes and then he's going to run another one. And, and, and again, that's what I'm trying to specifically address a component of this performance. I'm not saying that the guy doesn't need aerobic, aerobic, aerobically driven training, because again, I think I, the last study I saw on this was like 2001 and it said 43%, I believe was, was the, the contribution of the aerobic system. So it's very strongly aerobic. We need to ab absolutely train that system. But if I'm targeting the anaerobic component, I, I need to, to address that. So again, it's like, I, I have to understand the influence of the energy systems, but I don't really know which one is gonna, gonna contribute the, the most, but I can bias it a little bit. You see what I'm getting mm -hmm. at? Yeah. You know, so, so learn that stuff, understand it, but, but ultimately it's gonna depend on on what your outcome is going to be, because again, we just don't know. Like how much mm -hmm. how much ATP CP are you contributing to in a in a three mile run? I don't know. Yeah. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But but maybe he needs it for a kick, right? And so mm -hmm. maybe maybe you do a little bit of speed work as a component of, of his training to to address that. Um, you know, again, looking at what his time is, and you say, okay, so here's Here's the distance that you're going to need to cover in your kick. Here's how, how fast we want you to be able to do it. Here's what you can do now. Can we do it faster later on? And just look at the, 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 the pure outcome aspect of it versus saying, okay, we need to train his ATP CP system and we need to do this, this duration of interval and, and so on and mm -hmm. so forth in, in, in an attempt to increase whether rate or capacity uh, of that system. So mm -hmm. I, I would just try to look at it more from, from the, the outcome perspective. Okay, but don't and and again, I say this, and I said, don't negate your 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 study of understanding of those systems because it does allow you to make better decisions. Otherwise, you're just a superficial technician, and you're you're not really reasoning your way through this, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So, so I don't want to negate that. Okay, it's it, it, there is value in that understanding, but when you're actually writing the program, you got to look at like, okay, what are they capable of doing today? What do I need to get them by such and such a date? How am I going to get them there? Because you're not going to be thinking like. Oh, we need more glycolysis. We need more. You know, you just got to look at the times and, and what the outcome needs to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. That was awesome. Really? I, I think that, so like, you know, we started talking about the aerobic system and it's great, but it's not, you know, everyone needs a little bit of it. And if you had unlimited time, maybe you'd spend some time on it. But, you know, if you get someone for six weeks, what are you going to do? 
Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, you just don't have time for that 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 type of adaptation, and and that's yeah. unfortunately a lot of what happens in 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 our field is that we just don't get enough time. You know, if you if you had you know a year to train somebody or or an Olympic cycle, you know, to train somebody, it would be a whole different world, I think. And I think that that's where some of the programming gets confused a lot, you know, because again, people are trying to apply. Um, some of these these broad you know uh, uh, adaptations that are that are that are developed over a really really long time over these short things it's like well you need to do some cardiac output development and two weeks later your heart rate's lower and they go look see you're getting eccentric cardiac hypertrophy and that's that's really not gonna happen you know <laughs> it's like that's a really long term adaptation um, and, and so uh, um, we just need a little bit better understanding. So, uh, so just to not dangle that too much, what, what do you think is happening then if not eccentric cardiac hypertrophy? I, I, I think the, the, the best description that I've seen is, is the adaptation at the, uh, SA node. Is that correct? It's been a while since I've looked at this, but I think it's an SA. Node I believe that's right. Um, that, that influences the, the reduction in the, uh, heart rate first. I think that's what you see first. But when you're talking about like a morphological change in, in, in the structure of the heart, that takes time. You know, that's like saying, oh, I'm going to put you on a two-week mass building program and I'm going to, you know, you're going to end up with 30-inch thighs in two weeks and, you know, just follow the magazine principles or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I and I haven't looked into any topics on this, but do you know the plasticity of cardiac muscle versus skeletal muscle? Are they similar? Um, they are. They are. They are similar, but different. I can. I can tell you that. Um, I don't. Man, this is stuff that I just haven't studied in a really long time. No, no. I mean, me either. Wouldn't hold it against well, you. You're the anatomist. Come on, man. I mean, you're the one with the master's degree in anatomy. There's a lot of anatomy, Bill. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. I understand. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't re recall the the like the comparative rate. Is that what we're talking about? Like a rate of adaptation in the cardiac muscle versus? Well, well yeah, you might do a hypertrophy block for four, six, eight weeks, maybe, yeah. um, and and you know put on a few pounds of muscle throughout your body, but. If you do four, six, eight weeks of long, slow running, are you yeah, I mean, gonna get? Yeah, I, I know, man. I hate saying this, but it's probably gonna be like an n equals one kind of a thing. I think you're gonna be falling back on some genetics. I bet some people are gonna be like the high responders, and you're, a lot of people are gonna be the low responders, and then you're gonna get the people that are kind of all over the middle. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, I haven't looked at it. I, I certainly haven't looked at this in quite some time. So. Yeah. I can't speak with, with any any level of intelligence. I wonder what that, you know, genetics wise, what is it that gets some of those people with VO2 maxes of 80 and some people with 40? I don't know. I don't know. I When I was a student in, in my master's program and uh, um, the the theoretical max heart rate based on age went out the window when I, <laughs> I tested an 81 year old woman on a, on a cycle ergometer submaximal test. And she was quite comfortable with a heart rate of over 180. So <laughs> and yeah, she was from Germany. She grew up, she grew up in like the war torn Germany and she was a very tough little lady. And, 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 you know, you asked her, are you okay? And she's like, you know, getting in, the middle, like in the middle of the test, she just wanted to keep going. She wanted to test herself. So, so wow. You know, who, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it's what? What time is it over there? Eight thirty. It's eight thirty. Do you have any final thoughts? I, I didn't have one to start the show. I'm not going to have one to end the show. <laughs> uh oh, oh, wait, wait, Stephen, go <laughs> ahead. Go ahead. You like He's got to wrap it up now, right? <laughs> he's going to end the fight. Not only does he that could be your fight, role. He's going to end the fight. Yeah, there we go. Uh, could, could you briefly go over what happens to the spinal curvatures in 
normal inhalation and exhalation, like what happens to lumbar lordosis, cervical lordosis um, during inspiration and expiration? My, my perception of it would be that, that okay, so you got to think about expansion, right? So you're going to take all these curves. So the lordosis are, are going to reduce and the kyphosis will increase because of expansion it's there it, i mean you're get, so so if i so let's just cut somebody into a sagittal view right and and so you would see the the sacrum counter nutate that's going to reduce the the lumbar lordosis right mm -hmm. so if i get if i get um dorsal rostral expansion of the upper thorax and i get a sternal uh up pump handle so i got an ap expansion there so that's going to be a, a, an expansion of that kyphosis right mm -hmm. now it may not look like that but again that's the direction that it's moving okay. right so you're going to okay. see a, a re, you you would see essentially it would look like a reduction in curves but the, the kyphoses would follow each other the lordosis lordosis is that a word lordosis would follow each other as well on inhalation and then it would just go back during because the the re, you'd get some recoil associated with exhalation it's it's relatively passive it's not fully passive like some resources may indicate but but it's relatively passive so it will go back in the other direction perfect thanks mm -hmm. all right nice job bill Keaton, how'd we do? Good, I enjoyed it. Oh, good, good. Come back next month. Yes, sir. Tell your friends. Please. Uh, good luck with your cervical radiculopathies. Jason Neal, great to see you. Corey, thanks for bringing the heat today. Steven, can always count on you. Okay. And Corey Bill. got a new, got a new haircut. Yeah. Okay. I thought so. I thought so. Looks good. Is that a high top? Oh, very nice. Very nice. Oh, clean. Good. Good. Well done. Well done. All, All right, right, guys. Back in India anymore. <laughs> Everybody, see you all next week. Be sure to send this to all of your closest friends. And come join us at ifastu.com, ifastuniversity.com.